Today we're going to continue our study of the book of Luke, and we're going to be in Luke chapter 14. The majority of this chapter centers around Jesus's, dare we say, last dinner party with the Pharisees. Now, you know, back in 1967, there was a, a very famous movie uh, starring Spencer Tracy and Sidney Poitier. It was about a uh, daughter of a white couple that uh, brings home to her parents her black fiancé. And of course, the title of the movie was Guess Who's Coming to Dinner? And it was quite a conversation at dinner. A couple of years ago, 2005, there was a uh, kind of a, a loose remake with uh, Bernie Mac and Ashton Kirshner where the daughter of a black couple brings home a white guy as her fiancé to introduce her to her parents. Dare we say that was quite a conversation. The title of that movie was Guess Who? Today's lesson is entitled Guess Who's Coming to Dinner? And our first guest is Jesus. Luke chapter 14. One Sabbath. Well, let's just stop right there. You know, Jesus just couldn't wait till the Sabbath. You know what I'm talking about? This is like his, his, it was his dad's day. It was the day of rest for the father. But the Sabbath was the day that he could most challenge the Jewish leadership establishment with how far they had drifted in their understanding of the Mosaic Law. And so I believe on this Sabbath, Jesus is coming fresh from preaching the word. He's fired up. And so it says, one Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat at the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. There in front of him was a man suffering from dropsy. Jesus asked the Pharisee and the expert of the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So taking a hold of the man, he healed him, and sent him on his way. Then he asked him, If one of you has a son or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull him out? And they had nothing to say. Sounds like some familiar territory for those of us who have been studying the book of Luke, doesn't it not? Well, Jesus comes on in, and the Bible says that he was being very carefully watched. Now, the way the Greek is in verse 2, it says, there in front of him, and in some translations it says, behold, so there was a sense of surprise about this other guest. And because of a later remark about his host, I don't think it was the host that brought in this guest. He was either an uninvited guest, or perhaps one of the other Pharisees was trying to trap Jesus. But there in front of him, the Bible says, was a man suffering from dropsy. Now, now, dropsy is not a guy that's fumbled fingered, okay? Not some klutz. Dropsy is short for hydropsy, which is not a disease in and of itself, but it's a symptom of disease, which is swelling. It's edema. And so some swelling, you can have swelling in your leg that may not be all that serious. On the other hand, other swellings can be quite serious. It can, in fact, be something as serious as cancer. And so right here, though, we know that the man was swelled up enough that everybody knew he had dropsy. Now, in the eyes of the Jewish leadership at that time, anybody that had the swelling of his body was being punished by God for serious sexual sin. They made a jump in the conclusion right there. And so... There he is. Behold, there's this guy trusting right in front of Jesus. And I don't know what you can see. You can see kind of the Pharisees kind of backing away from him because here's a man being punished by God. And so Jesus steps up and he says, and he asks the Pharisees and the experts in the law, the scribes, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remain silent. So taking a hold of the man... And and the the expression right here is the idea of really grabbing him. He didn't just touch him. He grabbed him. He made everybody see he really cared about this guy. He just took a hold of him. He wasn't afraid of him. He wanted to show God's love. He took a hold of him, healed him, 
and he sent him on his way. So we see most likely he was not an invited dinner guest. Then he asked him, Now if one of you has a son or an ox that falls into a well on a Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull him out? And they had nothing to say. You know, I think sometimes we escape the, 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 the sense of, of drama that's right here. It's perhaps like an old-fashioned wedding. You know, right at the end when the preacher is asking the people, is there anyone in the crowd that has anything to say that would prevent these two from being married? And everybody's going, hoping nothing's being said. <laughs> Just, okay, I pronounce you man and wife. And, you know, everybody goes, oh, whew. Well, Jesus is saying right here, he says, hey, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? No one says anything. Heals the guy. Then he says, if one has a son that falls into a well or an ox that falls into a well, wouldn't you immediately pull him out? And they had nothing to say. There was nothing they could say. If they said, hold it, stop, well, they would have been lawbreakers. On the other hand, it was quite obvious this guy was suffering. And so if they would have said, you know, go ahead, don't do it, then bottom line, they would have been heartless. And so they said nothing. Now, Luke has this said twice because as we understand in Scripture, when something is said twice, it affirms something. And just like in a wedding, when there is silence and nobody has the Egyptians, things go on their way. And so Luke's point is, nothing is going to stop God. Nothing is going to stop Jesus. He is going to be on his way. Is that awesome or not? Well, let's continue to see what the dinner conversation is like. When he noticed how the guests picked their place of honor at the table, he told them this parable. Well, it's kind of interesting. The beginning of the dinner, Jesus is being carefully watched. Now we find Jesus is carefully watching them. Jesus has always turned the tables right here, isn't he? When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. For a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, Give this man your seat. Then humiliated, you'll have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place so that when your host comes, he'll say to you, friend, move on up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all your fellow guests. For everyone who exalts himself will be humble, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now right here, Jesus is going after their hearts and their sense of superiority that they had about them. When I read this, it, 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 it made me remember a time many years ago I'd been in preaching in India for quite some time, and I was in Bombay. And as fate would have it, the, the service ran long. The preacher talked a little bit too long. And uh, in Bombay, you've got to be at the airport three hours early, minimum. Bombay, India. I come on in, another disciple's with me, and we come on in to the desk there at the airline counter, and there are these three guys that are and swearing at the little airline representative. I mean, they are just going at it. I go, man, I wonder what's wrong with them. So I go along the side, and she comes on over to help me. And I said, hey, I'm on such, such a flight. She goes, oh, I'm so sorry. I just told these gentlemen, now I have to tell you, that uh, we have no more seats on that flight. And the next flight out to London is two days from now. And I'm going, now I understand why they're swearing and cussing and taking this letter out. You know? But you know, being a disciple, you go, I'm going to hold that on in right there. So I go, okay, miss, do you think you can just fly me out somewhere? Because I'm just hoping to escape, you know, so I can get, get out somewhere. Fly me to Paris. Fly me to the Middle East. So, <laughs> you know how you, you, get, you know, you're, in a, you're in a tense situation and you do one of those little Nehemiah prayers, like the, just a real quick one, you know? And so what I did, I had my, my, my ticket right here. I just said, Lord, please help me get out of here. And when I opened my eyes, my tickets were gone. And I go, oh, no. I turned to the disciples and said, do you, have, do you have my ticket? He goes, no. And I looked on over, and the airline representative was marking off my ticket. I go, uh, is that my ticket? She goes, shh. Did, 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 did you get me on a flight? What flight am I on? She says, we got news that there is one extra seat coming on in. And it's first class. 
And I go, you know something, miss, I, I got to be honest, these guys were here before I was. She says, I know. And they're going to be here a real long time <laughs> after you. <laughs> You see, when you exalt yourself, you're going to get humbled. When you humble yourself, you're going to get exalted. You know, a brother that I love a lot is Jeff Thompson. And bless his heart, Jeff's been going through some tough things the last couple of weeks or so. And Jeff was just saying, you know something, I just need to step back from leadership because I'm just not everything I need to be, at least in his mind. And uh, Carlos and I had an opportunity to talk to him and say, well, bro, listen. God simply wants you to go in the strength you have. And we really need you to step up and continue to lead out there. And he asked for, you know, we'd pray about it until Tuesday, but, you know, we had a chance to talk yesterday. He says, bro, I'm ready to go. Amen? Amen. And, you know, there's, there's, there's a humility there that, that, that's pretty awesome. You know, sometimes we have a hard time admitting to ourselves we're doing lousy spiritually. You know what I'm talking about? And we're so afraid of losing our place of honor that we don't want to confess our sin or confess our downness or confess even our loss of faith. And here's Jeff is saying, listen, you know, guys, I'm just not doing the best. I just, I need to take a step back. But we're going, bro, we really need you. And with that sense of encouragement, with that sense of, hey, God is with you and you are God's man out there, Jeff has been exalted because he's willing to do what God wants him to do. How about you? It is good to have an ambition for leadership, but are you the kind of person that pushes yourself forward or gets jealous of other people or feels like you are the one should have this or that opportunity? You need to understand. Just take a step back. You be humble, and God will exalt you. Amen, guys? Let's finish out a little bit of this dinner conversation right here. Verse 12. Then Jesus said to his host, okay, so now he's talking to the guy that invited him. When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers, relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back and you'll be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you'll be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you'll be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Jesus right here talks about hospitality and the heart of behind it. And Jesus right here, he says, listen, I appreciate this luncheon. And it's great that you invited all these other Pharisees and teachers of law, but you know, in a way of speaking, they're going to probably invite you over to their place sometime in the future. He says, really, what true hospitality is about is reaching out to, as he says right here, the poor and the crippled. Now remember, the lame and the blind are crippled people, so that's just an alliteration right there. He says, reaching out to the poor and the crippled because these people cannot repay your love. They cannot repay your hospitality. Now, in reaching out to Jesus, remember, even though Jesus was kind of the young, charismatic preacher at this time, very controversial, but still probably prized to have come over to your house, he was a poor preacher. And so in one sense, Jesus is giving a little bit of a nod to being invited over to his house. On the other hand, all the rest of the people were rich people that were likely going to invite his host back over at another time. You know, when I think about our congregation, I think about a lot of people that have the heart of Jesus and the heart of hospitality. And uh, some of the people that just come to mind in a, in a special way are individuals like the Kirstners, the Bordieres, and the Zindlers. You say, well, what do they do? When do they invite the, the, the poor and the crippled on over? Well, they invite the college students and the singles over all the time. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I especially appreciate the Zindlers. I mean, they've had over to their house several times the entire UCLA ministry. Now, that's sacrifice. Amen, guys? And I don't believe they've ever invited you on over there, but amen. Because that's really what hospitality is about. And I really want to challenge people to follow that kind of an example. It's great to have the other marrieds on over there your age, and, and they're going to have you on over next time, and then you'll be over back over there, and then you get to go back over there. That's great, that's good, and we need to encourage that. 
On the other hand, we've got some poor and crippled people in the church right here that would love a free meal, that would love a relationship to be pulled on in by a more mature brother and sister in Christ. Can I have an amen, campus and single people? Amen. You see, hospitality is one of the ultimate forms of love. And the ultimate mark of God's church is its love one for another. You know, one of the things that was so awesome in reading in the book of Acts is after Paul had been arrested and he finally makes it after shipwreck to Rome, the brothers and sisters in Rome go out to greet Paul. And Paul and the brothers were so fired up about it. And, you know, that's, that's really a hallmark of our church. You know, this Thursday night at midnight, Raul and Linda Moreno are coming on in to the airport from Santiago, Chile. And I know that a lot of us are going to go out to greet them. Because Raul and Linda have been leading in a great way the Santiago Church, and now they're coming here for more training, and they're going to be the new regional leaders for Orange County. Is that exciting? Amen, church? And so we need to understand that love means going out of your way without any sense that you're going to be repaid back for it. That's what the church is all about, is loving others more than yourself. Guess who's coming to dinner? It's Jesus. Well, let's see who else comes to dinner. Let's read on. Verse 15. When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the man who will eat at the feast of the kingdom of God. Well, that's, that sounds like a good-hearted statement. Don't you think so? And indeed it was. And his view of the kingdom was, because he was a Pharisee, he believed in a afterlife. He believed in heaven. And so his concept of the kingdom was a little bit limited. His concept of the kingdom was, was heaven. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I just brought a field. I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I just brought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, <laughs> I just got married, so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you have ordered has been done, but still there's room. Then the master told the servant, go out to the roads and the country lanes and make them come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those men who are invited will get a taste of my banquet. Wow, is that an intense parable or not? Let's see if we understand it. Right here, the owner of the house is preparing a great banquet. Amen? And as is the custom of that day, he gave out invitations way beforehand. And as the custom of that day, he sent out his servant on the day of the banquet to remind people about it. But in person after person, they all began to make excuses. The first guy says, hey, I can't come. I just brought a field. Going to see it. Please excuse me. The other guy says, I just brought five yoke of oxen. This is a rich guy because you were well-to-do if you had one yoke of oxen. He says, you know, I'm just on my way out to try them. Please excuse me. Then the next guy didn't even ask to be excused. He just said, I'm sure you will understand. I just got married. And of course, we know the Old Testament passage that says that a Jewish couple, when they first get married... The guy does not have to go to war for a year. So there is sort of a concept right there of stepping back from some commitments. And yet, the servant comes on back and reports this to his master, and the Bible says the owner of the house becomes angry. He's upset. And he orders the servant, then, okay, then go out to the streets and allies of town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Let's stop right there. But well, we understand right here that the owner of the house is God. Amen? Because it's a singular servant, we understand that the servant is Jesus. Different than the parallel passage in the book of Matthew that talks about many servants, which would include Jesus and the prophets and the apostles, 
This one is only talking about Jesus. Now, we need to follow Jesus' example, right? Amen, church? But the first level of understanding is that that is who Jesus is. What are they doing? Well, they're inviting people to the kingdom of God, the feast. Well, you know, one of my favorite two feasts that I get to enjoy in my life, one of them is Thanksgiving, and one of them, my wife is Cuban, is a Christmas Eve night called Noche Buena, the good night. And believe me, it is a good night. And Elena just goes all out on these occasions. I mean, she goes to grocery stores and she just buys all these different ingredients and everything. And she always comes up with this, this cranking pork roast. I say, just get the white meat, just the white meat. And all this chicken, she gets all the seasonings, the mojo sauce and all that. And she seasons that for about a day. Then she goes out and gets the black beans. She soaks them in water for a day. Then she puts all stuff on in it and... And then she puts it in the refrigerator for a day. And uh, then we have a little bit of green beans because we got to be healthy. And then um, in my family, we had kind of a divided thing. We had to have sweet potatoes with marshmallows on it. And then some of us just wanted just regular mashed potatoes. You know what I'm talking about right here? And then for dessert, my favorite dessert in all the world is pecan pie. And Elena makes it from scratch. And of course, you got to have it a la mode if you know what I'm talking about right here. And so this is the feast that I look forward to every Thanksgiving and every Noche Buena. Well, you know, the feast of the kingdom is, is pretty incredible. The kingdom is more than heaven, but if it was only heaven, that would be pretty awesome. Amen, guys? What, what does the kingdom include? Well, it includes our present salvation. It includes having the gift of the Holy Spirit that gives you not only strength to be able to live the Christian life, but insight into the will of God. You have the Word of God that tells you what you need to do to please God and to have an awesome life. You've got incredible friends and family in the kingdom, in the church, in God's family that literally will die for you. You've got an incredible relationship with God where you get to talk to the creator of the universe. You have, bottom line, a place you can go to when you get in trouble, when you're hurting. You have a safe place, a shelter from the storm, not only with God, but with brothers and sisters who aren't going to turn around and condemn you for the things that you've fallen short in. And bottom line, you have the perpetual forgiveness of sins as long as you're trying to walk in light. Are you with me right here? Now that's quite a kingdom. Are you with me here, church? That's kind of interesting. The Bible says right here, that God prepared this kingdom. Well, question has to come. We understand how much it took for Elena to prepare the feast. Let's see how much it took for God to prepare the feast of the kingdom. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1. In verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Wow! In the kingdom we have every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons to Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he has lavished upon us with all wisdom and understanding. What did it take for God to prepare the kingdom? Well, first of all, we realize the sacrifice of so many of our wives to prepare a feast for us is, number one, the time. The time. It takes Elena three days to get ready for Thanksgiving or Noche Buena. How long has God been preparing the feast? He says right here in verse 4, before the creation of the world. That's a long time. What was the price? Now, you know, we, we, the Lord has always blessed us with food on the table at our house. But I mean to tell you, I mean, 
when Elena goes, I mean, she goes out and gets the best pork roast. Those are not cheap. All the little ingredients, not cheap. All the other stuff, it's not cheap. It's costly to prepare a feast. Because it's not just our family. We usually invite a lot of other folks to come be with us. We want to share our feast. What was the cost for God to prepare the feast of the kingdom of heaven? The Bible says right here, it's through Jesus' blood that redemption and the forgiveness of sins have come. So now, let's look back at the parable. I think sometimes we look at that parable and it seems, well, the owner of the house was just so unreasonable. Here the feast of the kingdom has been prepared. People knew about the invitation. I'm talking about the Jewish leadership here. And yet when the time came, they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I just brought a field. Hey, my business is more important than the feast of the kingdom. Please excuse me. Hey, I just brought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Of course, you know, we have that theme again of Jesus being the way, but this guy's going his own way. The whole concept of money, wealth, and security. More important than the kingdom. And then, the guy that doesn't even ask, please excuse me, the guy says, I just got married. You obviously got to understand, God, how important my new marriage is. I'm not going to come. And the Bible says that God is angry and he is hurt. He has prepared the feast of the kingdom before creation and sacrificed his son. And other people said, this is more important than the kingdom of God. Now, sometimes we, we really blow off the incredible blessings of the kingdom. We say, man, it just takes so much gas to travel that 45 minutes to church. I mean, don't you understand how much gas costs? I won't be able to come to Wednesday night. Don't you understand my commitment? It's my non-Christian husband. I want him to become a Christian. So you've got to understand why I'm not going to be able to make all the services. Well, you, you understand, it's, these are my kids, and the kids are important to me. And the thing that's ironic is, the thing that gave us all good marriages was the kingdom. And when we start putting our marriage and our kids before the kingdom, that's when everything starts to go topsy-turvy. It's so ironic when we value it more than the kingdom. And so when the servant, who is Jesus, comes back and reports to the master, the Bible says the owner of the house became angry and ordered the servant, go out quickly into the streets, the alleys of town to bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, lame. There's a lot to be said right here. Go out quickly. There's an urgency behind the message of Jesus Christ. He is to go into all parts of the city, the streets, even the alleys. Why? Who's going to come to the banquet? The poor and the crippled. That's who's coming. To the feast. And he's talking right here about the Jews that recognize their spiritual poverty and the sense that they are crippled spiritually. And sir, the servant says, verse 22, what you've ordered has been done, but still there's room. Then the master said to the servant, go out to the roads of the country lanes and make them come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those men who are invited will get a taste of my banquet. So the servant goes back and he says, hey, there's still room. And the master says, God says to Jesus, well, go out to the roads and the country lanes. Go outside the city. And of course, now we understand. He says, now go to the Gentile world. We got world evangelism right here. Now you say, well, why didn't the apostles catch on? I mean, over and over again, Jesus talks about the salvation of Jew and Gentile. It's because they were thrown off 
by a wrong interpretation right here. See, many Jews by this time were living in other cities outside of Israel, and those were called, called the Jews of the diaspora, the dispersion. They were dispersed during the exiles and things like this. And so when the Jew heard this, they thought, oh, yes, well, we'll just get the Jewish people in these far-off lands, not understanding that Jesus meant everybody. And for most of us in the room, that's a good thing because we're all Gentiles. Amen, guys? At the very end, he says, I tell you, not one of those men who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. You see, a customer that day, if someone couldn't come to your feast, you would send them leftovers of the feast. And God says, listen, they will get absolutely nothing because they put a higher priority on something else besides this banquet that I have been preparing before creation itself at the sacrifice of my son. You know, I, I, I love the concept right here of the fact that Jesus is the servant and we're to be like that servant. And there's one line that says, go out to the roads and the country lanes and make them come in. You know, for a lot of disciples, that, that bothers them because they don't want to push anybody. No, we, we, need to, we need to start getting comfortable with the call that we're to be like Jesus. Amen, guys? And Jesus made people uncomfortable. That was why I was so uncomfortable at that dinner table. You think it was uncomfortable for Cindy Portier talking to all those white people? You think it was uncomfortable for Ashton Kirsten talking to all those black people? Jesus was not afraid of the uncomfortable. He was the one that made the conversation. How about it? Are you the one making conversation at work? Are you the one making conversation at school? Are you the one making conversation in your neighborhoods? Or are you afraid of the uncomfortable? When was the last time you made someone come to Bible talk? Or church? You know, one of my favorite evangelizers in the church is Vic Jr. You know, Vic is just as bold as a lion. He'll go up, so says, I don't want to come. No, you're coming. And you know, that person usually comes. Because they sense inside of Vic, this is super important. You've got to come. This is my everything. People do have a lot of other stuff going. Why aren't there people at your Bible talk? Because you're not making them come. You're not like Jesus. You're afraid of uncomfortable conversations. Jesus, his heart was to make his father's house full. Amen? So guess who's coming to dinner? Jesus is coming to dinner. The poor and the crippled are coming to dinner. But in our last section, we find out, guess who's coming to dinner? Only disciples. Let's look at verse 25. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus. And turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father, mother, his wife, and children, brothers, and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who doesn't carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one anyone's built a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost, see if it has money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and was not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he's able with 10,000 men to oppose one coming against him with 20,000? If he's not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Three times in this little span of scripture, Jesus uses the phrase, listen, you got to do this or you cannot be my disciple. Verse 26, verse 27, and verse 33, Jesus was plain talking. The only way to misunderstand Jesus is that you didn't want to understand Jesus. Now, I love the placement that Luke has put right here 
Because in the last section about the parable, we find the servant going out and wanting to make God's house full. But now, Luke introduces this huge crowd. And Jesus lays it out with the crowd about what it takes to go to the feast. In other words, Jesus isn't in to just having a big church. Jesus is only in to having disciples, sold-out disciples, make up his church. Are you with me right here? And so right here, in a very real way, he thins the crowd. What a, what a challenging thing right here. At the beginning, he says, if anyone comes to me and doesn't hate his father and mother, his wife, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. You know what's kind of an interesting insight? In verse 26, it says, if anyone comes to me, in other words, entry into the kingdom. But verse 27 goes, and if anyone doesn't carry his cross and follow me. So that's kind of the concept of the journey. So discipleship is required to enter the kingdom, and discipleship is required to continue the journey, so to speak, to Jerusalem, to the cross, to salvation. Amen, guys? Now, the first challenge Jesus gives is that we've got to love Jesus more than any other person. A lot of people say, well, it doesn't really say hate here. You know, in the Greek, it does say hate. It says hate. Now, we understand it's not animosity. It's the degree of loving less. He says, if you're going to be my disciple, then you've got to understand, you've got to love me so much more then your father, your mother, your wife, your brother, your sister, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, yourself. Or you can't be my disciple. It's just settled. And that degree of loving less is so great that it's almost a chasm of hate. What's the issue? Who are these people? These people, for most of us, are the most important and influential people in our lives. And very often, if they think differently on some subject, we're going to go their direction. But the true disciple says, listen, I'm going to do what Jesus wants me to do, even if my family opposes it. Why? Is it in rebellion for the family? No, not really. What you're doing is you're taking a stand for God, showing you love him first, and by taking a stand, now you got a hope to pull your family to God. Are you with me right here? You know, the concept of being a disciple is both in the Greek world and the Jewish world. It's well known at that time. If you were going to be a learned person, you would sit under someone like a Plato or a Socrates or an Aristotle, and you would be his disciple. In the Jewish world, if you wanted to be a rabbi, you would have to sit under a rabbi. That's why in the book of Luke, Jesus is referred to as a teacher, whereas with the other evangelists, he's referred to as a rabbi. But the concept is both in the Jewish and the Hellenistic world, to be a disciple is a learner. You see, where you're at right now, you've never been before. I mean, you may be a 17-year-old high school student. And you go, I've never been a 17-year-old high school student before. You need to be a learner. You may be a 26-year-old college freshman. And you've never been there before. You need to be a disciple. You may be a 56-year-old grandpa. And you've never been there before. You need to be a learner. You see, a disciple's heart is someone that is willing to learn. They don't do it their way. They do it God's way. Are you with me right here, guys? And to understand God's way, we need to get into his word, and we need to seek counsel from brothers and sisters in Christ. That's what it means to have the heart of a disciple. He says if you don't carry your cross, if you're not willing to go through persecution, you can't be a disciple. And then, very interesting, he tells two parables. They're easily understood. One is to build a tower. The rich people in this day and age would have a tower, kind of like our silos, where they would store food and tools. And it costs a lot of money to build these silos. 
And so the story right here is that, hey, if you want to build a tower, won't you first sit down and count the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? Because it would really be stupid. And besides that, all your neighbors will ridicule you if you only build it halfway and you run out of money. You know, this is really true. I, I still remember on our way to church to Boston, we always took Interstate 93. I don't know whether Elise remembers. But on Interstate 93, they'd run out of money to complete the exit on into the city in one direction. And you see this one exit, and it was always barred right here, where it goes about 25 feet, and then it's just a huge drop-off. They stopped it. And almost every time I go to church, I just go, that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. Well, how much more so is someone that doesn't take the time and count the cost about what it takes to be a disciple? Now, Jesus is the master teacher, amen? And he makes you think. But look what he says in the second parable. He says there are two kings, one with 20,000 guys, one with 10,000. Well, my, my favorite game growing up was the game of risk, where you have all these armies there in Africa trying to attack Europe or something like that. And almost always, the, the bigger clump of armies would win. That's just how it is. And so it is right here. He's saying, hey, Jesus is the king with 20,000. You're the king with 10,000. So, dude, you're going to lose. If you're smart, while Jesus is still a long ways off, you're going to ask for terms of peace and get in with Jesus, have a good relationship right there. Otherwise, you're going to be destroyed. So the first parable says, hey, count the cost. Think it through. The second parable says, yeah, count the cost, but consider the alternative, life and death. Well, let's see, which way am I going to go? I'm going life. Amen. Jesus was the master motivator. Amen, guys? At the very end, he says simply this, in the same way, any of you who doesn't give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Wow, everything. You know, I, I, I remember when uh, I was a college kid, uh, one of the things that I, I, I loved that I had to crucify was buying clothes. Back in those days, he called someone like that a clothes horse, you know. And I remember even... Even going out on a couple of my first dates with Elena, she was just taken back by all my clothes. I remember, like, I, I later found out afterwards, she didn't tell me on that particular first date, but I, I, I wore my silver shirt, my long sleeve silver shirt. I had, I had my flared bell-bottom pants with cuffs. And I had my three-inch heels. I mean, and I, I was dressed. I knew how to dress. And if I saw something I liked, I'd buy it. And you know something? That was something I had to crucify. First of all, to get married to Elena, but, but you know, things just, it's almost like you got a magnet, like this. You know, we, we went to Hawaii and helped plant the church there this past week. But we had three days vacation, which was awesome. But you know, you go by all those shops, you go, oh boy, I really like that. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that when you go into a store? How something starts calling your name and you're drawn towards it? I just got to have that couch. Oh, I got to have that car. I must have that t-shirt. I cannot live without it. And those gym shoes. Oh, I got to have those ones. I mean, it's amazing. It's their magnets. It goes like that. And you know something that still dogs us as disciples? I gotta keep my house. I gotta have this car. I gotta have these clothes. I mean, after all, I have to keep up my reputation so I can share Christ. <laughs> Jesus, listen. The only way is to give up everything. You know, uh, as I mentioned before, this, this past week was one of the joys of Elena's in my life, was being able to go with the mission team from here and plant the Honolulu International Christian Church. We sent out nine of the most lovable, cranking disciples. And they met up with this past week 14 disciples of what we call a remnant group in Honolulu. Now, four of these people had previously been in the ministry. But Elena and I went on over for the express purpose of making sure we could meld the two groups. 
I mean, the, the mission team, I mean, they were fired up. I mean, they left everything. The remnant group, oh, they were meeting, and they're aligned with us. And yeah, they want to evangelize the world, but you know some, They weren't making time for D-times. They said they had discipleship partners, but they never met. Oh, Bible talks were about once a month. They tried to kind of meld Bible talk in midweek because of family. And so we had to go in over there, and person by person, we had to sit down and count the cost of being a disciple. One of the passages I used was this one in Luke 14. But the two great areas that were of concern to me for people that called themselves disciples were their priorities in materialism and their family priorities. And so some of the passages I showed them was this. I think we're all familiar with the parable of the soils, right? And how the third seed, the seed started to grow, but after a while the thorns started to choke it out. Let's look at what each of the gospel writers say about it quickly. This is what I showed each of the remnant people. Turn to Matthew 13. Matthew 13, verse 22. The one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. Whoa. Well, let's see what Mark has to say. Mark chapter 4, verse 18. Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desire for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Woo. Let's see what Luke has to say. Luke chapter 8, verse 14. The seed that fell among the thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, remember the way of God or the way of yourself, as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. But the seed on the good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. Wow, this thing is challenging. It's challenging. And the fruit that he's talking about right here, guys, is making disciples. Remember, the Spirit doesn't even come to the book of Acts. So it can't be the Spirit's fruit. He's not around yet. The fruit of making disciples. And right here, Luke says, listen, the reason somebody is not fruitful is life's worries, riches, and pleasures. They choke the life out so that they don't mature. Do you realize that a disciple who is not fruitful is not a mature disciple? Hebrews chapter 5 says the same thing. He says, man, by this time, you ought to be eating the meat of the word and be a teacher, but we still have to feed you the milk of the word to you. See, a lot of people think, well, I've been around the kingdom five years. I've been around the kingdom 15 years. I've been around the kingdom 25 years. Therefore, I am mature. No, you're not. You're just old. You're not mature. Please, let's, let's not do that. You are not a mature disciple unless you're a fruitful disciple. That's what the word of God says. But I want to be fruitful. I really do. Well, the Bible says, the noble and good heart it's not the wannabe guy, but the one that produces a crop. Wow. It's not scripture, but it's true. Good intentions pave the road to hell. Wow. You can have all the good intentions you want about being fruitful. But if you're not focused in on the kingdom, you do not have a good and noble heart according to Jesus, our Savior. You know, we, we, we talked to each of the remnant people. And we said, guys... We have a special contribution, and we laid it on out. A lot of them are struggling in jobs. A lot of them are struggling with the recession over there that's hit Hawaii hard. We also had to talk about the priority of the family. You know, there's been a very serious false teaching that a lot of us have gotten from denominational churches or churches that have gone denominational. They preached God first, your family second, church third, your job, leadership, whatever. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. It's God and his church, your family, job, and so on. See, we need to understand, our love for one another is what makes it so special to be a church. What destroyed our former fellowship was when people started to put 
physical family above spiritual family because they've been hurt by their spiritual family and therefore they move back to be with their physical family because they lost trust in God and lost trust in their spiritual family. If you want to be in a great church, you've got to be in a church that believes they are the sons and daughters of God and their first priority is to God and his church. Are you with me right here? We laid that on out. You should have seen some of the eyes open. And the tears cried. Some of the people had been so consumed with their kids' sports, they hadn't even been at church for so long. Yet they want the kid to be a Christian. Where are the priorities? You know, it was awesome. We had the non-mission team members. We had the 14 remnant people. Together, that's 23 disciples. We only had a few days to work for our church service. On Sunday, we had 85 in attendance. Is that awesome? You see, they understood. See, by Sunday, there began to be a blur between the remnant group and the mission team. We also had a special contribution. Our goal was $10,000. The mission team couldn't bring much on over. But you know, the remnant group, we all gave in total $24,000. You see, they believed in what they were all about. And there were some incredible sacrifices that were made. You know, we, we're going to have to look at our hearts right here, guys. Where are we really at? We need to understand, in this church, the Word of God is not only an ideal that is preached, but is the standard that we're going to call each other to. It's not just what the preacher needs to do. It's not just what the leaders need to do. It is the call of Jesus Christ to be a disciple. And either you're a disciple or you're not. Are you with me right here? And we need to understand that what we're all about is helping other people who are poor and crippled get to know Jesus Christ. Because that's how we've been healed. By his wounds. Amen? Let's finish this text on up. Two more verses. Verse 34 and 35. Salt is good. But if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It's thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Well, let's fix up this last one. He who has ears. Who's got, who's got ears here today? Okay, you're supposed to be doing the hearing right now. It's for everybody. You know... In the ancient times, salt had three functions. Number one, it was a seasoning. Number two, it was a fertilizer. And number three, it was a preservative. Now, while salty, it could perform all of these things. But when it lost its saltiness, it would be worth it, worthless. Evidently, in the ancient world, bakers covered the floor of their ovens with salt. Now, there are two reasons. Number one, it gave a catalytic effect to the fuel. So what's the fuel? Cow dung. So it made it burn faster and hotter. But also took away some of the smell. That's a good thing. Amen, guys? Amen. But you know, after it's lost its saltiness, it was worthless, and so it was thrown out. I mean, who'd want to eat their bread that smelled like cow dung? See, it's you want good work in salt. See, most salt at that time came from around the Dead Sea. And in the Dead Sea salt, it actually has a lot of impurities, and that's why it was used as a fertilizer. Is they put it on whatever they wanted to fertilize, put water on it, it would evaporate quickly, and actually the impurities then would go down in the ground to give it a lot of its nourishments. But once the salt had lost its saltiness, they'd scrape it off and throw it away. It lost its value. One of my favorite commentators on the book of Luke, Fox said, losing saltiness is the modern idiom for running out of gas. As the disciple, have you ever felt like you ran out of gas? Fox says the reason, and what he says right here, is because you no longer are primarily following Jesus Christ. You're on your own way. And so you've lost your saltiness. You've run 
out of gas. You know, in our, in our congregation, uh, yesterday, that trashathon, as I shared about, at least in the West, was, was a lot of fun. But we got out there, and we found all kinds of junk, all kinds of trash. Magazines, papers, syringes, gloves, condoms, chair, grocery carts, and I found a dead bird. Now, it was my misfortune and finding the dead bird that was early on. And so the stench, have you ever picked up something just incredibly dead? <laughs> and the, the, I appreciate that we had gloves, but after about two minutes, they dissolved on my hands. So I'm getting like this, putting it in, and the stench was just there, because it was early on, and it's just this, this bird, dead bird stench was just kind of hitting me, you know? <laughs> and it was motivating to work hard and fast to fill up my sack. But, you know, it occurred to me in every case, whether for a noble use or ignoble use, all of these things at one time were useful. Magazines, papers, syringe, glove, condom, uh, chair, grocery carts. But now, they're all trash. And even us human beings, we're going, well, it's, it's tragic, but these things are worthless. It's time in the bags. Take them. And get rid of them. That's the same hardline teaching that's right here. When a disciple loses their saltiness, their salty conversation. Have you ever rubbed salt in your wound? Ooh, baby. That's how Christians talk to people. People say, you rubbed me the wrong way. Well, good. It's the false prophets that everybody likes. See, our conversations need to be seasoned with salt. We're going to talk about things that sting a little bit. But you know, the other purpose was to fertilize. It helps grow. It's also a preservative. There's nothing worse than something that has the stench of death. But you know something? The Bible teaches clearly here that a disciple can become worthless. Now, I realize that we have some people that have a low self-esteem, and you guys, Satan gets to you by saying, oh, you are worthless, you're nothing, and God says, hold it, you're everything to me. Jesus Christ has died for you. But sometimes when we're feeling worthless, it's because we're doing nothing, and we are worthless. That's what it says right here. See, sometimes our feelings are right. You know, uh, there's a lot to be said about the grace of God. And next week, we're going to go into chapter 15, which is the prodigal son. And that talks about when a disciple loses his saltiness, falls away, but God in his love is waiting for him to come back. See, God's love, God's grace is awesome, but you can lose the grace of God. You cannot take advantage of the grace of God. And we praise God for the grace of God. Amen, guys? You know, a couple that really does fire me up is Raul and Linda Moreno. And for those that don't know them, they leave the church of Santiago, as I said earlier. And it's been tough knowing that Matt and Helen and Melina were going to come down and take over the leadership of the church. And it, it's been a long, hard road for Raul and Linda. And frankly, the last couple of months have been challenging. But I remember Raul about a month ago saying, you know something, bro? I just, I just can't kind of hand over a church that's barely on their way over to Matt. I've got I've to really go after it. I've got to, so to speak, compel people to get baptized. Now, they hadn't been having very many baptisms. So Raul started going to work and calling the other 40 members to go to work. This past Sunday, which was Matt and Helen's and Melina's first Sunday down there, they had two baptisms. Today, this Sunday, one week later, which is now Raul and Linda's last Sunday, they're having two more baptisms. Is that awesome right there? You see, you, you got to have this mindset to make them come in and to realize that if you're not working for the Lord, you, you become worthless as a disciple. Wow. You know, right now we're going through a lot of transitions in our church. And I think some of us are actually a little worried about the church. 
And granted, it's been a hit down there in Orange County to lose Kyle and Joan and for the most part, a lot of the mission team, amen, guys? Now, we praise God for Ron and Tracy kind of holding the fort for the time being. But you know, a lot of people think, well, we'll just send out a mission team and it won't affect us. You know, that's probably not a very wise way to go. I think Vic and Aurora, with a little baby on the way, real close, are understanding that when you give birth to a new being, it costs the body that gives it a little bit. You know what I'm talking about right here? Moms, you know what I'm talking about? I mean, your body is not the same body as before baby, after baby. So it is with us. There's a price. There is a price we pay as the body of Christ to send off mission teams. Orange County's paid the main price for the Hawaiian team. And the team in the north, or the, the region in the north, you're going to pay the main price for the New York team. Now, just because it affects us doesn't mean that we don't want to give birth to new church plantings. This is what it's all about. I mean, there's no way that Vic and Aurora are going to say, hold it, we don't want the baby now. Besides, if they did, it's too late. You can't turn back. Because when that little baby comes, you go, oh, man, this is such a cute little baby. And, you know, when we were over there in Honolulu, it's such a cute little church. I mean, it was amazing what God did. I mean... Not only did those 23 disciples have 85 out, not only did they have a contribution of $24,000, but God has really just blessed them. They meet for free in the most beautiful building I know anybody meeting in. It does happen to be a mortuary. Now, you know what a mortuary is. That's where they have the dead people services and everything, you know. And they did have a few caskets in there the day before when we were looking over the mortuary. And I was yelled at by one guy when I walked into the wrong room and there were two dead bodies right there. But we won't get into all that. Because, see, that's not going to happen in our church. We don't have a dead church. There are no dead bodies right there. So we don't have to worry about those kind of things on Sunday, do we? But we need to understand that, that God is out to bless that church and God is out to bless us. We're going through some transitions. What does it take? Orange County, it takes each of you getting focused and fired up to step it up and be a disciple of Jesus Christ. North, yeah, DJ and Casey are leaving. It's going to be a hit. And the rest of those young people that are going, it's going to be a hit. But daggone, they're going to have a cute little baby church out there in New York. And we need to step up and be disciples. Are you with me right here? The people in the East, hey, I had an email come on in and say, bro, we're really hurting the finance there. We even need help with our gas. They have long distances out there. People in the West, we got key brothers that don't have jobs. This recession's hit. The Latin ministry has some real family challenges. Listen, we've all got some challenges right now, but here's what we got to do. It's time to stop going our way and get back to Jesus' way. It's time to understand we need to become salty again. Guess who's coming to dinner? Jesus is coming. The poor and the crippled are coming. Only disciples are coming. And I pray that you'll be in their number two.